um, which dovetails nicely off of some of the stuff we looked at the last two weeks in the catechism. But anyway, um, I'm ready whenever you are. All right, well, let me start by praying. Our Father, we thank you for assembling us today. And Lord, for all those that are traveling, we pray for your traveling mercies for them, and that they would have a restful time on vacation. We pray for uh, this time of study, that you would make it profitable to us, that you would help us to understand your word and the great hope of your gospel and the reign of your Son, Jesus Christ. We pray that He would be honored as we consider these things. In Jesus' name, amen. So turn to 1 Corinthians 15, specifically verses 24 through 28. When I preached on Easter Sunday, I read that whole text starting at verse 20, but I only handled 20 through 23 about the first fruits. And that dealt with Christ as the first fruit of our resurrection, but it also started to set us up to answer very pastoral, very nagging questions that we always have, which is, well, if Christ dealt this death blow to Satan, sin, and death, in other words, everything that you can think of within the curse, why do I still sin? Why is there still suffering? Why does it look like the devil's having a field day? Um, all of those kind of questions and others... Why do Christians still die? Um, that gave us a handle on that. We could talk more about that. But then the rest of the passage I specifically waited on because there's two very weighty uh, subjects in them that are impossible to get into. Um, and really, even in one sermon, they're impossible to even do anything but scratch the surface on. But let me read the text. And then we'll talk about at least the first of those two issues, and hopefully both. Starting in verse 24, Then comes the end, when He delivers the kingdom to God the Father, after destroying every rule and every authority and power. For He must reign until He has put all His enemies under His feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. For God has put all things in subjection under His feet. But when it says all things are put in subjection, it is plain that He is accepted who put all things in subjection under Him. When all things are subjected to Him, then the Son Himself will also be subjected to Him who put all all things in subjection under him, that God may be all in all. Now, in one sense, these are two very distinct doctrines being discussed, one being eschatology and the kingdom and its advance. There's also a question of Trinitarianism and the Son of God and subjection, because there is an ancient heresy and a modern version of it called subordinationism, which could be read into this text in verse 28. What I want to suggest is that the two issues are very related, as you would expect. You know, Paul's not going on some different... This is all one train of thought. So when we study it doctrinally, we might study them as separate doctrines. But it's a really good text to understand how they both condition each other. In fact, even that ending part might have seemed to you like a tongue twister. You know, um, it is plain that he is accepted who put all things under him. So this is alternating hymns. When all things are subjected to him, then the Son himself will also be subjected to him who put all things in subjection under him. Who, I don't know if I can keep track of who the him is at each part of the sentence. Actually, we can if we focus uh, on what's being talked about. So hopefully we'll get to that. But let's get to that first part first. Then comes the end. When he delivers the kingdom of God, or sorry, d delivers the kingdom to God the Father. So who's the first he here in verse 24? Jesus. When he, Christ, delivers. So have that in your mind throughout the whole passage. Christ, 
as the perfect man, as the king in that office. You, know, you talk about the three offices of Christ. He's prophet, priest, and king. This is his mediatorial role. This is in reference to his human nature. So already some clues as to that second subject. But Christ is delivering the kingdom to God the Father. Now, when you see Christ in passages being shown in some kind of inferior position to the Father, as John's Gospel, he says a couple times, the Father is greater than I or something like that or that He sent the Son. One way it could be asked, as Augustine did in his book on the Trinity, is how can the Son, and this is from the position of the Arians that he was arguing against, how could the Son be both sender and sent? Because He's God. And the sent is His human nature, the incarnation. Therefore, here's a hint, when He speaks about the greater authority of the Father, He is speaking in reference to His human nature and in His mission. Now, mission is actually a technical term. There's the distinction between the processions of the three persons of the Trinity. In this case, it would be the Son and the Spirit who are sent. And the missions of the Son and the Spirit. The Father wouldn't have a mission. The Latin word missio means I send. And so that word is a specific reference to the way in which the Son is being sent into the world and the way in which the Spirit is being sent into the world. And there's a controversy there historically between the Eastern Church and the Western Church. The Western Church added to the language of the creed what's called the filioque clause from the Latin word filius for son. And so it means literally in the Latin, and the son, filioque. And the son what? And the, and the Spirit is sent by the Father and the Son, they added that language. Now, I don't want to get into rabbit trail, but that can be defended. Augustine did, and Selm wrote a whole book defending the language of the Son being sent, sorry, of the Spirit being sent also by the Son. There's two verses in John, one in John 14 and one in John 20, verse 21. There are two ways in which the Son is shown there to send the Spirit also. But that's what the word mission refers to. So it is not speaking about an inferiority of the Son in His eternal nature to the Father. That would be a heresy called subordinationism. And Arianism, in a sense, is a form of subordinationism, the ancient heresy of Arianism, because Arius taught at the beginning of the 4th century that there was when the Son was not. There was a time when He was not. So Arius was claiming that the Son was the first of all created things, but He still saves. We still worship Him. The response of the Orthodox at this point, there's a lot of responses, but two responses are, so a creature will save you, and you're worshiping a creature? That's a problem. That's two problems, okay? But they're the same sort of problem, okay? So the Scriptures in these passages are referring to A, His human nature, and B, His mission. In particular, his mission, his mediatorial role as the king, and he is the king of a kingdom. So when you start going there, you're automatically uh, right away at eschatological issues. Um, one last point before I get back into the text. When we study eschatology, as I've said before, what do we do as Americans? We're very sensationalistic. We start focusing on all the things that are the most obscure and oftentimes the ones that the Bible specifically says, no, stop. You, you can't know that. So what do we want to do? What's the time of the Lord's return? And let's play pin the tail on the Antichrist. Let's do those two things. Those are the two things the Bible says, no, stop, stop it. <laughs> you, you don't know. You can't know that. Now, there's, there's passages people will look at and say, well, look in 2 Thessalonians 2. And even in the Olivet Discourse, there, there are signs. If you look at those, those are general signs. Those are practical signs, much like the fruit on the tree in Matthew 7, 15 through 20. There's a kind of practical judgment. There's a kind of need-to-know basis. You need to know the spirit of the Antichrist just so far as you don't fall for him. You don't need to know the exact name of the dude, if indeed it's even one person. could be, you know, John says in his letter, many Antichrists have gone out into the world. And many false prophets, many spirits. This is the spirit of the Antichrist. So there's all sorts of things that we don't know, and the Scriptures say you can't know. Strangely enough, though, there are things in eschatology that are crystal clear and everywhere. 
And I would put at the top of that list two things. One, the day of the Lord's return in terms, in terms of its nature, not its time. Like, is there a second coming of Christ? Is it bodily, visible? Does all the stuff we looked at last, uh, well, two classes ago. There's tons of verses on that. And you start collecting that information, and you can a pretty good detailed list of things that will happen when Christ returns. The second thing is the kingdom of God itself, that it has come in some way in His first coming, and that it will be consummated in His second coming. There's tons of verses on both of those. What do we do? Those aren't interesting to us. But the Antichrist and the exact time, so I can break out my Mayan calendar or my some other numerology thing, that's very interesting to us, so we go to that stuff. But the Bible speaks in the exact opposite way. Here's a text that bridges the gap between Christ's kingdom being inaugurated the first time and His kingdom coming again. Now, even if you agree on that, as all Reformed people would tend to, that still doesn't settle the question of amillennialism versus postmillennialism. And the language here, both sides can look at and say, hey, look at that. So what language am I talking about? Well, he starts out by saying, then comes the end. But then he backtracks. And how do we know he backtracks? Because when he points to the end, then, he tells us some things that to, to expect at the end. He's going to crush all of his enemies under his feet. He's, there's a last enemy, death. That'll be destroyed. So he's telling us a bunch of things that happen at the end. But then he says, for, which just means because. In some way, this is happening. This is all delaying till the end because he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. Now, one way to understand a reign and a rule, and I think we do this both about Christ's being in control of everything and about the devil not being in control of everything. So we can look at the devil being in chains. We looked at that a little bit a couple weeks ago in the Q&A time about Revelation 20. If the devil's bound, what about this? What about that? And well, maybe this is his being loosed at the end of the time and so on. And those are interesting questions. But the first thing we might want to ask ourselves is, can't those things be relativized anyway? In other words, could Christ be reigning in one sense at one time and not in every sense until the end? Or couldn't the devil be bound in one sense and not in every sense? First of all, the chains and things like that are figurative anyway. So we have to ask ourselves more questions than simply saying, well, if he's reigning and he's bound, then everything should be roses here and everything can under control here. Well, wait a minute. You're taking figurative language and you're imposing like an all or nothing kind of a structure on it. When this verse and many others like it are saying, there's an already and there's a not yet. There's a, he dealt with death, but he really deals with death over here. He deals with all your sin over here, but you still sin. He's going to get rid of all sin over here. He deals with Satan over here. He comes into the world to defeat the works of the enemy, 1 John 3, 8. But Revelation 20, it's not until then that he, that he actually casts him into hell. So you see with all of those things a pattern of already... Not yet. You have the foretaste, but then you have the whole thing. In other words, the theological words for those are the inauguration of the kingdom and the consummation of the kingdom. And they're both true. And verse 25 is saying that in some way, God has, you know, there's nothing in God that had to do it this way, but God has chosen to do it this way, where there's these two stages where he there's a kind of necessity, not in God, but given His choice to do it this way, something about this must glorify Christ. He doesn't tell us everything we'd like to know here, but He's saying that Christ must reign over a progressive period. It is a progressive reign in which He is putting enemies under His feet. Now, an Amelianus looks at that and says, yes, the reign started then and doesn't depend on every enemy. In other words, we can't say, well, Jesus, and who would say this? Christians wouldn't say this. No Christian would say, Jesus, you're not reigning. You're not in control of everything, anything, because you're not in control of everything. We, we wouldn't say that. But our theology charts, our, our eschatology charts may actually say that. Because all we're saying here at this point is that 
Christ is reigning. The amillennialists will say he has a spiritual reign over the church. Now I'm going to say something that all Reformed people agree with, but then we'll start to interpret it differently. There is what is uh, called the dual reign of Christ. There are two senses in which he reigns. Because another question that can come up, even if you don't care about eschatology, maybe you're a new believer, and you might say, why are there all these places in the Bible, Psalm 2 or right here, that talk about Jesus inheriting a kingdom? Isn't he already God? Why is God giving to him a kingdom? And now here, he's in some way giving it back to him. Well, again, it's referring to his human nature. And so the Reformed have this doctrine, which is in, pretty uncontroversial. I, to, to be a Christian is, is to believe this at some sense. Reformed people just articulate in this way. And that is that there is an essential reign of Christ by virtue of Him being the eternal Son. In that sense, He already does reign and rule over everything. So Psalm 24, 1, the earth is the Lord's and everything in it. So He reigns and rules over all things as God. It's impossible for him not to be the Lord of all things as God. But then in addition to the essential reign of Christ, there's also what is called the mediatorial reign of Christ. And so there you have Psalm 2 and Psalm 110 of God promising this reign to him or his announcement in history in 2 Samuel 7, which is really just a continuation or an unpacking of the Abrahamic covenant. The Davidic covenant is just within that, part of that same covenant because he tells Abraham, kings shall come from you. In Genesis 17. And so the Davidic covenant is the royal flowering of the Abrahamic covenant. It's the royal or kingly part of it. And so God is promising not a David, not even a really, really good David who never sins but is still just merely a man, but the David to come, the Christ. And Christ, of course, Christos in the Greek, from the Hebrew word from which we get Messiah, just means anointed one. So in a little C way or in a little M way, David would have been a Messiah. And so the Jews looked to him and literally to him to have his throne restored. They they saw that as, as purely an earthly, now a perfected king, a Messiah. But Peter in his sermon at Pentecost in Acts chapter 2 is saying that that was fulfilled At that time. Now, Pentecost, I like to think, is the coronation ceremony. When a king comes to the throne, he has someone preach in his court. It's the coronation sermon. If you say, when did the the, the rain start? I mean, Matthew 12 talks about it, a sign of the kingdom coming. So many times Jesus in the gospel says, if I do this, the kingdom of heaven has come upon you. The kingdom of God is near you. The kingdom of God is in you. The kingdom has come. All these things. When did it happen, though? Well, we call that the ascension of Christ. When he ascends at the end of Luke's gospel, the beginning of Acts, Acts 1, talks about the ascension of Christ. Where was he ascending to? He was ascending to the throne. Matthew 28, 18, he says, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. And so, there, so he's not ascended yet, but he's, he's, as, he's as good as ascended. He's making the point that it's happening. It's happening right now. The mediatorial reign of Christ is happening. I might come back to Acts 2 to give you the sense of how Peter claims that. But on that amillennial point, they look at that and say, yes, his reign has been inaugurated, and this is the mediatorial reign of Christ, by which he is the head of the church, Colossians 1.18. Now, postmillennials will say, well, read with Colossians 1.18, Ephesians 1.20 through 23 as well, that he's given as head over the whole world for the church. He did say in Matthew 28, 18, I just read it, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. What's what's happening in this debate at this point? Postmillennialists are suspicious that amillennialists are reducing this reign of the kingdom to just a spiritual, ethereal, Sunday morning only, you can't talk about culture and politics. I mean, let's just go right to it. Postmillennialists look at amillennialists and say, it seems like you're interpreting the spiritual reign of Christ to be just spiritual. In other words, like a pietist, 
even maybe like a Gnostic. That you're dividing churchy things, which Christ reigns over, but we can't tell the world how to do X, Y, and Z in a Christian way. Now, now if I say it like this, we can't... Church's job to grab hold of this or that thing in culture. Well, in one sense, that's true. The, the Bible speaks about different symbols. The, the church's authority is symbolized by keys in Matthew 16. The state's uh, authority is symbolized by a sword in Romans 13. It's, keys are not the sword, and the sword is not the keys. So if you mean that these are distinct offices with distinct prerogatives and powers, amen. We agree. If you mean that the church ought not speak over those issues, then we have a problem. Because Christ says, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. The labels amillennialism and postmillennialism hardly existed before the 20th century. It'd be an interesting study, you know, where did they first show up? I don't even know, actually. But amillennialism as we know it now, well, first of all, if you want the first treatment of the thousand years being treated figuratively, go to Augustine, at least explicitly. Augustine at the end of the City of God talks about that. So he said, well, he was an millennialist. You look at the Reformers, and they're, and they're all, all post-millennialists. They're expecting the kingdom now and so on. Well, I think we're overlapping a lot of questions. And that is the nature of the thousand years in Revelation 20. How do we interpret that? It is interesting, by the way, that the phrase thousand years only shows up in two places. One is Revelation 20 in this highly symbolic book. And the only other place is 2 Peter 3, where he specifically says that the Lord doesn't count time as you count time. For him, a day is a thousand years, and a thousand years is a day. Isn't that interesting? The only two places you would look for help to see whether or not this literal is literal, it's screaming to you that it's not literal. Um, so you're not millennials, right? Well, the problem, though, is, is that in the 20th century... After Bavink and after Ritterboss, and in the newer interpretations of it, especially at Westminster, West Escondido, you have a particular slant on it that does reduce the spiritual reign of Christ in the mediatorial office to only spiritual things. But the church is not competent to speak to things outside of those churchy things, those private things. And postmillennialists rightly point to the great Christian tradition and say, it's not what anybody ever believed. And in this passage, Christ is defeating enemies, and He doesn't tell you. He specifically, in this passage, what do those enemies look like? They look like Angels in heaven, certainly the words that he uses here, every rule, every authority, and power. You think that'll help us? Maybe. But if you look in various passages where the words rule and authority and power are used, and you look at it in the Greek, you're still not helped because they're used in both ways. Even in Romans 13, there's a debate, there has been, among various commentators about whether or not the word authorities there means angels which I don't think it does, and most commentators don't. But why did they bring it up? Well, um, one reason is because Colossians 1, 15 through 20, uses these words in that way. could be both. Ephesians 6, 10 through 13, in, when Paul's introducing spiritual warfare, that he talks about these uh, being the, 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 the things, I'll say things because what are they that we wrestle against? Are they demons are, are, are is it just angels going to war against demons and you don't worry about that? Well, okay, but why is Paul telling us about it then? Is it just because it's neat or something, or does it have any bearing on our life? Apparently it does, because Paul's giving us a to-do list there about this thing called spiritual warfare. But here, Christ is defeating these. I, I think I'll give you my own view. There's a great quote by Francis Schaeffer, which I didn't think to bring here, but it's in his book, The Great Evangelical Disaster, I can't even paraphrase it, but I can give you the gist of it. What Schaefer's basically saying is that evangelicals suffer from bits and pieces thinking. And we're not the first people to do this, but we do tend to 
picture think in a wrong way. We do tend to think of heavenly things, you know, way up there somewhere and earthly things down here. And then sometimes we can take our own spiritual experience and then add a layer and say, well, well, God is giving us this, a spiritual warfare to fight. Okay, I know what that means. It means praying for sure, um, but everything's spiritualized. Even the way that you pray is spiritualized. It's not, thinking is not, fighting certainly not. No, 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 no. Um, you know, doing schools a certain way, and that's all fleshly stuff. And we start imposing a Gnosticism on this idea. And Schaefer's saying, spiritual warfare in the Bible is not just heaven or just earth. And you can take a, a Gnostic extreme or a naturalistic extreme. Instead, yes, there is this battle in the heavenlies that is mysterious. There's verses we can look at, but we don't really know how that plays out. We do know that it does play out on the earthly stage. How much of the earthly stage? What Schaefer was saying is everything. There's another passage, 2 Corinthians 10, 4 and 5, where Paul says, the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh. And, and your first thought, not you, <laughs> your first thought if you suffer from this Gnostic idea is, exactly, they're not of the flesh. They're not thinking in books and school and fighting and what's going on in the culture. And um, look, you don't think like that consistently in real life. If your own child is being uh, uh, beguiled by some university professor to believe in atheism, you're going to drop that right away and you're going to start praying for your child. For what? Nothing? For spiritual fuzzies? No. That he will start thinking more clearly and resisting this nonsense, which is something happening in the real world. So Schaefer's point is that this spiritual warfare that's going on up there, there's no up there and down here. We're in it. This is the physical stage of it, but that war issues forth onto the stage of history through everything, thoughts, feelings, decisions. There's no part of it that's unspiritual in this sense, in the sense that it ought to be enlisted in this battle. But getting back to this, Jesus is defeating all of these gradually. He doesn't give us an exact order, except he does say death comes at the end. That's the one part he does tell us the order. But God has put all things in subjection under his feet. So it's pretty clear by now the way the postmillennialist is going to push back to the amillennialist and say, look, this isn't just a present reign. We agree with you on that. So in that sense, amillennialist and postmillennialist are both post in that Christ returns after this reign. Now, the postmillennialist will say progresses. Finish the sentence, amillennialist. The amillennialist will say, look, we don't have enough information that it can progress by missions, by the sheer number of people brought in by the gospel. And that can come mostly through suffering. So I'll argue uh, for the amillennialist there. I'm, I'm not here to change anybody's mind on that because I think um, it's, a, an, it's an illegitimate divide to begin with. Um, they should be agreed on these things and they're, and they're taking things that are true and pitting them against each other. That's my view. Um, but then this last part of the text, I'll just I'll end here because it's, it's hard, but there's no way to get it easier without spending way too much time on it and beating a dead horse. We don't want to do that. And that is this part about the Son and all things being in subjection under Him. So just to untangle, if it is tangled for you, all the hymns in 27 through 28, God is the one who is sovereignly directing all things through the agency of His Son and specifically His human nature and mediatorial role. So, all things are put in subjection under the Son, that is, all things in creation. The exception there that Paul's talking about is God Himself. God Himself is not being subjected under the human Christ. And for that same reason, the Son of God in His divine nature is not placed under the Father as to His divine nature. That would be eternal subordinationism. But you might say, you still have a problem here with that explanation. See, if I go to, if you make the same mistake in 1 Corinthians 11:2, there's another verse that does something like this. It's easier to solve there because there it's talking about the head of every woman's man, the head of every man, man is Christ. The head of Christ is God. And you're like, whoa, whoa, there's another passage where the Son is subjected to the Father. However, there it specifically says Christ and not the Son. 
And so there you can say, Paul is being specific. He is clearly talking about the human Christ. And that's nice, but the critic will say, he doesn't do that here. So what's, how, what's the solution here? And I've solved every part of it except for this. Why wouldn't Paul use the word Christ? And I'll end with this. This gets deep, but just give me two seconds. <laughs> yeah. deep, deep concept in two seconds. Um, there is a Latin phrase that I have brought up before, and I'll use it here. It's called the communicatio idiomatum, and here's what it means. When you're talking about the Son of God, either in His divine nature or His human nature, you can and it is appropriate to speak about one person, because it is, the eternal Son of God. But if Christ is the acting subject, no matter what you're talking about Him doing or being, you can attribute something of one of the natures to him as a whole, so long as you do not confuse the two natures. Here's a biblical example. Acts chapter 20, verse 28. Might be 27. No, it's 28. He's talking, about, talking to the elders, the Ephesian elders, Paul is, and he's giving them some commands. And here's the part that's, that matters for us. The elders have been made elders by the Holy Spirit over the church of God, which God purchased with His own blood. Why didn't Paul just say Christ there so we wouldn't get confused? Why would he? So you see the problem? God doesn't bleed. God doesn't have a body. One of the ancient heresies is called patripassianism, the suffering of the Father. That was a heresy. Because the divine nature does not suffer. The divine nature does not have a body. And the divine nature cannot bleed. But Paul can do that because he's talking about the Son. Now you have to go to other contexts to know that that's what he's talking about. But we can do that because it's just Christianity 101 to know that Jesus is the one who came down and bled. But there's that Latin phrase that is used to describe what's going on there. Is that what Paul's doing here in 1 Corinthians 15, 28? The answer is, it has to be, because you're all out of options. Or you have to embrace that heresy of subordinationism, that the eternal Son is under or less than the eternal Father. And, and that would be inching toward Arianism as well. So the heresy of subordinationism and possibly the heresy of Arianism. So, the Son Himself will also be subjected to Him who put all things. Paul is still working with the same context. He's talking about the Son in His human nature, subjecting the kingdom, presenting the kingdom to the Father for the glory of God in the end. That it will be finally consummated. How does that glorify God? There will be no more enemies. There will be no more debate. There will be none of that stuff. Um, all will be under His rule in, in that total sense that we're thinking of. There will be no more um, enemies and no more, uh, no loose ends. Everything will be perfect in this kingdom. So with that, I will, I will end and I will open it up to uh, questions. Yes. This all kind of reminds me of John 1, 1 and 2. Mm-hmm. Yeah, right. And so from the beginning, their mm -hmm. plan, I mean, they didn't need to create right. what we know as the creation. Yeah. But it was in the plan, so even though he had not come physically yet, he chose to step a bit lower than God the Father mm -hmm. to incorporate and be the eternal God-man. Yeah. Yeah. And so as God, he can present back to God. Mm -hmm. But in his human nature, that this is where, you know, the combined, I don't understand. But <laughs> he's in charge. Yeah, yeah. And still, you yeah. know, you think about how Satan went to God and asked for uh, Job. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay, so he's not loose and free totally. Right. He's on a leash. Yeah. It's an interesting. Today, I think he's 
still on a leash, although things can be pretty terrible. Yeah. That's another thing people bring up is um, how can Satan be in the, um, in the courts of heaven? And one answer to that has to do with Christ conquering him. In Revelation 12, you have both that are talked about. Satan accusing the brethren, but then you also see him thrown out. So is he only doing that beforehand? Well, that wouldn't make sense to John communicating that to us now, post the cross and the work of Christ. But there's other parts to the answer of it. First of all, this idea of heaven, part of the dilemma for people is, how can, how can he, if Satan's fallen, if he's sin, and, and God's eyes are too pure to see evil, how does he even, how does he even show up there? Uh, statements like that about God's holiness are not talking about any kind of ontological weakness in God, just the opposite. It's talking about his um, moral view towards sin. Okay, It's not talking about like if, if sin gets too close to him in some spatial sense that something bad will happen to God. And I think, um, and if you put it that way, people say, well, no, that's not what I mean. But the problem is, what else do you mean? You're, you're kind of thinking of this spatially. Um, and that's Obviously, again, it's a very mysterious concept, but the idea of heaven, we, we do have to challenge this idea that heaven is, is just X amount of miles that way. Um, the spiritual realm is actually not only infinitely bigger than the physical universe and our world, but in fact is pervading it. We are inside of it. Um, that The goings-on of heaven are entirely um, causal, and it's behind the scenes. It's the real, real world. Not that this is not real, but that this is the manifestation of that. This is the outer edges of that. Um, th this is this is the page of the drama. It's not the actual scriptwriter and the and the real characters. We're like the understudies <laughs> um, by comparison. I, I know that sounds gnostic to some people, but actually, no. It's actually redeeming the physical world and saying the physical world is actually heightened in importance because it's inside of this great spiritual war. Yeah. Any questions? Yeah. Um, in verse 23, and, and just starting in the whole first part of our passage here, when it talks about Christ at his coming, which is tied to uh, us being raised, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and then the end, he delivers the kingdom puts an end, for he, and then the, the, the concluding phrase, for he must reign. Is there a chronology there? Is it talking about a single time? Or is, it, is there a sequence of events in, in your understanding? I don't think there's a chronology in the sense that the literature mirrors the chronology. In other words, uh, the first way to mean chronology, not to say that you mean that, but the first way to mean chronology is, am I looking at a left to right chart here? In ver as I go from verse 24 to 25. And there I think the answer is no. But I don't, uh, because the word for is functioning not as a, as a link in a chronological chain, but as a logical connective. And therefore what comes after is a grounding. And it's not a time grounding necessarily. It won't answer all of our questions about time. But it's, it's a kingdom grounding. Something about Christ's reigning in this way, whatever that means, and there could be debate between the millennial positions, but whatever this means about this reign, therefore, Paul's saying, therefore, um, stuff's going to wait till the end to get finalized. So he's, he's keeping with his theme of waiting. He's keeping with his theme of already, not yet. Because the driving question that all of us have is not really, hey, I've got a better prophecy chart than you. The driving question for all of us is really, why do I still sin? Why does Satan still look like he's in charge? Those are the driving questions. So Paul's telling us, I don't have a total answer for you, but here's why God's waiting and here's what he's doing through Christ. And, and, it, it's, and I'm, again, not to pick on prophecy charts, it, it's a strike, a significant strike against premillennialism because the, the kingdom concept is overwhelmingly talked about in the New Testament as, as this kind of a thing, as something that started when Christ came and is finalized when Christ returns. Um, it just never talks about it as something that starts when he returns, and it just never talks like that. Now, where do premillennialists get that? Well, one way is to read Revelation entirely chronologically and say, well, once I get to the thousand years over here, but there's several problems with that. 
One is you have several cycles of things repeating. For example, two second comings of Christ and total victories of Christ in Revelation 11 and then 19, and the same language is used. So there's something cyclical happening in Revelation just to begin with. Um, but, you know, that's, that's where they get that idea. But there's, there's all sorts of problems that would emerge from a, a literal thousand years after Christ returns. Any last questions? All right, let me pray. Our Father, we thank you for this time in your word. We pray that it would be a blessing to us, that it would not only inform and enlighten the mind, but also to steady our hearts as we see things in this world, and we are constantly tempted to wonder about your reign and your rule and your sovereignty over all things. We pray that you would steady our hearts in this, and not only that, but that we would be like those who would live in expectation of you conquering all of your enemies. So help us to glorify you in that way today, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.